Thank you, Ramai Tato. Uh, my name is Steve Mahari. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Massey University, and I'll be what's called your continuity person for today, not incontinence person, the continuity person uh, for today. You'll be very pleased to know one very big fact about uh, the bustling nature of New Plymouth at the present time, I think, Stuart, and that is there was a traffic jam getting in from the airport. And that's, that's I think, a very, very good point. That's what we all want in, in regions these days. There's lots of traffic telling us there's lots of activity going on, and there certainly was a bit of a challenge getting in from the airport to be here. Uh, let me say, first of all, that we are looking towards the exit over here, exit here. You move out into the street. If there is any, any major emergency, Stuart Trundle will be screaming out that way, so just follow him. Lana Ryan, who is a local, knows her way around and she'll scream out that way to, to lead you if there is a, a, an emergency of, of any particular kind. If there is an earthquake, you do have to drop, cover and hold. And given the nature of the seating here, you probably will meet your future wife or husband by doing, <laughs> doing that, I would think. So enjoy it if there is, is, is an earthquake, but uh, keep, keep safe during the day. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do today, because we're going to move through very quickly uh, through a brisk program and then give you a chance to mix and mingle and and talk with each other. We're going to hear today from distinguished professor uh, Paul Spoonley, uh, who is going to be talking about population changes in your region, and I'll come back to that and tell you a little bit more later on. He'll be followed by associate professor Richard Shaw, who will be talking about what regions are doing about these kinds of changes around the world, looking at policy changes, activities, actions that people take as their population uh, changes. Then we'll move to a policy panel discussion where people will look at what they think are the responses to what they have heard that might be useful for your region. I do want to apologise for Barbara Kruger who wanted to be here today but as you know one of the problems of being an MP is that you have to get leave from Parliament and on this occasion uh, somebody else must have got them before her because she's unable to be with us but she has sent us a video and we will look at that at the beginning of our panel discussion. We had a couple of other withdrawals as well due to illness on the part of Mayor Andrew Judd, uh, who unfortunately is ill and able to come, but sends his regards and interest. And Jamie Tuta from the Maori uh, Trustees and CEO of uh, Te Tumu Paiwa, uh, also can't come because of a death in the family. Uh, so he will be unable to be with us, but also sends his regards. Richard Williams, who I'll introduce later on, CEO of Taranaki Chamber of Commerce, has stepped into the fray, so thank you Richard for, for doing that, we're looking forward to hearing your views. Ryan Evans, the editor of Taranaki Daily News, Stuart Trundle, CEO of Venture Taranaki, and Hayley Radich from Sacred Heart Girls College will make up our panel. When we finish that, we'll go into a question and answer session, uh, which we'll invite you to be part of. We will then close and give you a chance to mix and mingle and collar anybody you want to, to talk with as a result of what you have heard today. There'll be a little bit of uh, mixing and mingling around drinking and nibbles at the end as well. So that's our, our particular program. Now, we also want to be able to let you do something really interesting during, during the forum. Oh, let's, let's go back to the one we were going to show before, which is to say, if you want to tweet us, that's how you do it. So we tweet here, tweet us. It's so old fashioned now, isn't it? You probably don't do it the way you're Instagramming or something like that. But if you, you are tweeting, this is how you would uh, do it, just to tell us what you think uh, during the session. We will also collate and make, make those tweets available to people in terms of your thoughts. So 140 characters of distilled wisdom is what we're after if you're, uh, you're doing that. Um, now we'll go the other way. I think we're working now. So uh, the, the general theme of today, as you know, builds on this idea of a new New Zealand talk a lot about these kinds of issues of where the country is going at the present time, what are the major changes uh, that are driving uh, the country. That will inform us. But before we get on to that, I just want to show you a brief video that positions where Massey sits within this theme of the new New Zealand.
Okay, let me just start, introduce a little bit more of the forum by taking you through a bit of the background of what we've been doing around this theme of the new New Zealand over, over the last little while, because for us, this is basically what we think should be talked about in this country, and that is that there are major trends that we will have to cope with if we are going to succeed in the 21st century. So we, over the last little while, have been saying to ourselves, what are those themes, and how do we bring them together in some way that makes them sensible to people so that they can actually respond to them. It's not our job as a university, by the way, to tell you what to do, but it is our job as a university to provide you with an understanding, the information, the research, the analysis that might help you begin to understand what's going on and to suggest the range of responses that you might want to take on board. In the end, it's up to you, of course, of what you do in a local region. You have to say what fits you, what you think you can see yourselves doing, but what we hope will accomplish today is to say there are major changes going on. We're a university that wants to help you understand and you respond. So what we've been doing over the last little while up here is trying to work around this region. It's a very handsome picture of, of Stuart here, because part of what we're doing is forming a partnership with local uh, people here, with uh, the agency that Stuart heads. Uh, uh, are you here, Ms. Governor Brown? Are you in the FB right there? works here locally for us as a partnership between Venture Taranaki and Massey University and been doing some wonderful work of connecting what we're trying to do with the university and with the local region. So if you are thinking about these things afterwards, we do have a local connection between us where we can take our different ideas forward. Now, when we began this, this series of New New Zealand Four a few years ago, we said to ourselves, who, who would be a good person to start this off? And we came across this person, many of you will read the magazine that he's the editor of, this is Daniel Franklin. He's the executive editor of The Economist magazine. And about four years ago, they released a book called 2050, What Are the Mega Trends That We All Have to Be Aware Of in the 21st Century If We Had a Cope With What Is Going On. If you flick your eyes down there, you'll just see some of the themes that are in this book. And you can see from that that this is no, no small matter. Uh, from simple things like population in the world increasing from its current around 7 billion to around about 9 billion within the next 20 years. Through things like the changes that we have in areas like our use of uh, digital media, for example, nobody was on Facebook in 2004, amazing, and now there are more than 1.5 billion people on Facebook, which makes it the biggest nation in the world. There's nothing bigger than the Facebook nation. Those kinds of changes are the things that he talked about. So we brought him out to New Zealand and we got him to talk about these broad ranges of themes to a wide range of people. And one of the themes, of course, that he picked up on is the change in where the economic centre of the world will be. His argument uh, was that it will change to Asia. So we brought this gentleman out, out here, uh, Martin Jakes, who's a professor in the UK and in China and in the USA had just written this book called When China Rules the World, a very large and very impressive book, a bestseller on Amazon for a long time. So we brought him out here to say, well, if that's one of the major themes, let's start talking about what that means for this country. And one of the things he provided while he was here, for example, is most New Zealanders do not speak a language other than English. Uh, there are people here who do speak other languages because they have come from uh, a different culture and they brought the hustle or something with them. And of course, there are indigenous language in the form of Māori, but most New Zealanders do not speak an Asian language, which is pretty interesting, as he pointed out, if you're considering being an Asia-Pacific nation and trading with these nations. That's an interesting challenge for our school system. So he left, I think, an enduring message behind about the need for the country to prepare for this century. We also produce things like this, which you'll see again this year if you're a Herald subscriber. Uh, you will see this in uh, November, December, when they produce a joint publication between <coughs> ourselves and them, just looking at the year ahead, what are the trends that we need to be aware of as, as New Zealanders. So, the next thing we wanted to do was to move on to where we thought another theme might be that we should be focusing on as a nation. And of course, one of the key things that we have all been discussing over the last little while is a change in our population. Our population is changing dramatically uh, to the extent that we are talking about super diversity. And the person who has led that debate is distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley. Uh, Paul Spoonley's work has been to point out that we now have 213 distinct nationalities, cultures living in our country. This is a, a huge change in a very short period of time. 
What does it mean? But on top of that, Paul has been talking about a number of other major trends that impact particularly on all of our cities around the country, but in different ways. So important to get to know what is happening in your region, not just to super diversity, but also what it means for many other changes that are going on uh, around our different regions. They have implications for us, economically, socially, culturally. What are they? How do we respond to them? Those are the questions that he's being raised. So I'm going to turn to, to ask uh, Paul to come and speak to us now. I just want to explain to you what distinguished means before uh, as, he, as he comes up, because you'll be familiar with the idea that people are professors. Uh, distinguished professor is a title which is seldom given to people in universities in countries around the world. We have nine of them at Massey, and we allow a maximum of ten of them, because you have to be someone who is of international renown to be able to get this on a major scale. You cannot get this if you are simply famous in New Zealand, well known in the world. You have to be a scholar of global relevance. That's what Paul Spoon is, and that's why his work is having so much impact. Please welcome Paul Spoon. Um, as Steve has indicated, we're doing quite a lot of work and we're about to do some work here in Taranaki. There are two projects, one called Nga Tangata Ohu Mairangi, which is what will the uh, population shape of New Zealand look like in 2036. And the second, we recently... Um, were awarded at five million dollars to look at the impacts of, de of uh, demographic change and diversity on New Zealand and its institutions. And really today what I want to do is, is identify three particular changes that I think people in Taranaki ought to be thinking about and I'll apply um, my general points to those. But can I start by a general point and that is to say that yes we need to look at what is happening economically, yes we need to understand where the labour market is going. But alongside that, demographic change is going to really reshape New Zealand in fundamental ways, and in a way that we've never experienced before, and let me explain what that is. So it's really the general point to, to say, don't take your eye off demographic change. Uh, there is a rather, um, no, it's not. Um, there is a rather ugly title that has been coined in Europe but late last year, because this is not a, a problem that's unique to New Zealand or to Taranaki. It is something that you'll find around the Western world, particularly in the OECD. Um, Paul Krugman, who you will know is a, is a very famous economist, has coined this term secular stagnation. And it's really the point that the demographic changes are going to compound or constrain some of the economic opportunities that we have. So if we don't deal with those demographic changes, then some of our economic options are not going to come to fruition or they're going to be problematic. So I'm going to identify three. There are others, but let me deal with um, three. Um, the first is ageing. Um, this is not a problem. It is a fact. And New Plymouth is actually leading the country to some extent. I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but as of next year, you will have more people over the age of 65 than you will have people under the age of 15. And that's what's happening around the country. The rest of Taranaki is not going to reach that point for a few years yet. It is uh, particular to uh, New Plymouth. Um, as you can see there, what I've put together are some words that can capture what is a very complex area. Um, the thing that I really want to press on you is that 65 is not the age of retirement. Or, uh, over a quarter of New Zealanders are in paid employment beyond that age. Uh, there are significant challenges, how we continue to look after and pay for this ageing population. But it is the healthiest and wealthiest 65 plus population ever. And if I think about what my parents were doing at age 65 and what I hope to be doing at age 65 very soon, um, we, are, we are engaging in our communities, engaging in paid work and doing things in quite a different way. So please don't think about what we've done in the past. This is one of those areas where it is going to change significantly. Last, last um, uh, census, 2013, 600,000 New Zealanders were over the age of 65. One decade on, 1.1 million. So it's occurring right around the country. 
Uh, if we look at um, Taranaki, there are some particular aspects of what's happening in Taranaki. So if we look out into the future, and this is Natalie Jackson, who's part of the team, and I should have acknowledged that team because I'm, I'm using their collective wisdom here tonight. If you look at this, what you have is two um, bar charts. One on the right is concerning New Zealand. The one on the left is Taranaki. And what it tells you is that as we look forward to 2031, there will be no growth in the younger age groups in Taranaki. In fact, they will decline. And the, um, the graph, the, the bars below the line there indicate the nature of that decline. The growth that's going to occur from now on, the population growth that's going to occur from now on, is largely going to be in the plus 65. So this is really new territory for all of us. And the second area is to say that this has implications. These demographic changes have fundamental implications for employment and skills. And we've been doing a series of regional reports. We've done five of them. We haven't done Taranaki. That's yet to come. But in those reports, we've talked to uh, year 13, we've talked to employers, and we've talked to households. And, and there, there is a real issue that's beginning to emerge, and that is, and it's circular, that is, if you don't have local skill supply, then employers find it difficult to stay in that region, and so they migrate. So maintaining skill supply is absolutely essential. And related to that, increasingly our skill supply is being provided offshore. It is being provided by immigrants. And I'm going to come to the immigrant story in a moment. So I've seen the, the, the data, and I'll come back to that at the moment, that is beginning to emerge with um, Venture Taranaki to say that skill shortages are quite a significant issue here. And uh, just to uh, echo that, um, a quarter, I think, uh, stewards of businesses in Taranaki are, are, are reporting problems, problems in recruiting skilled workers. And that, I think, is trending up. Um, what I want to say is there's a, there's a, it's a very, and I'll go to the final point, there is a very interesting dynamic here, and that is that in a region like Taranaki, very soon we're going to get to the point where more people will be exiting the workforce at whatever age than will be entering it. So there is a supply deficit. There is also a related question, which is a skills deficit. And here... Um, the need, not in employment, education and training, for Taranaki is actually quite high compared with the national average. So that's 14.4% of um, teenagers uh, and those up to the age of 24 are not in employment, education or training. That must be a concern. The dependency ratio, if I can just explain that for a second, what you have on the right, the figure five, are the number of people in paid employment. What you, the figure on the left are the people who are dependent on the people in paid employment in some way, that might be directly or indirectly, so they are the under, they are, um, they are the people at school, they are people on benefits, and they are the people who have exited the workforce. So we're going to move to a situation in 2031 where it's almost one for one, one paid person, one person paid work worker, and, and one person who is dependent on that. Let me come to the um, question of um, migration and immigration to Taranaki. The 2008-2013 figures indicate a net um, immigration loss of nearly 800 people. So you had over 6,000 people arrive as immigrants into the region, but almost 7,000 left in that period. So over those seven years, there was a net loss. There is also, to go back to the point, there is a net migration loss which is basically 15 to 24-year-olds. I think Hayley might address this later. Uh, the good news is that that looks as though it's turning around. And remember that the 2008-2013 dealt with the global financial crisis. People were leaving New Zealand. In one year, 54,000 left for Australia in 2012. And regions, including Taranaki, were a contributor to that. So my third point, before I come to some of the... the, the including concluding comments, is to say that in this new scenario, there is a very strong competitive element between regions in terms of keeping and attracting populations. And we, in the case of a region like Taranaki, 
need to use the word like population stagnation if we're talking about its population future. That need not be the case, but in terms of the median uh, estimations, the population here in the region will stagnate and most of the growth will occur in that 75 plus um, uh, population. Auckland. Auckland is our centre of population growth, and you'll see the next slide. It is also the centre of our jobs growth in this country, and it is going to go from the current third of the population to 40% of the population. It will move quite rapidly over the next decade from 1.5 to 2 million. So it is sucking up population growth, whether that's natural increase or related to immigration. And in that environment, not only are you competing for population, for people, you're also competing for skills. I know it's not a message which is well received in many regions, but it's a reality of the next two decades in New Zealand, and so I think it's something that needs to be engaged with and understood. And that regional divergence means that 60% of our population growth will occur in Auckland. If you include the Golden Triangle of Auckland, Hamilton and Tauranga, then you're going to suck up a large proportion of the population growth. And the agglomeration effect is that simply the, the, the growth generates further growth. And so Auckland will dominate this country in ways that it doesn't even at this particular point. So we are left with, and this is my concluding slide before I, I make some, um, some suggestions, uh, we're left with Taranaki, a new demography occurring, uh, emerging in Taranaki. So yes, there's been growth. It's been modest, about 3,000 uh, new, uh, new um, uh, growth of about 3,000 people uh, since 2008. But out of that, we need to recognise that the 15 to 24s are leaving and they're not necessarily coming back. Some of them are, but uh, uh, there is a net loss there and there is a net loss or has been a net loss in terms of international migrants. So what do you do in a, in a province where you see much of the population growth growing in the 65 plus group. What do you do in a province in which the over 65s outnumber the children in the province, the under 14s? And um, that ageing of the population is really accelerated by the loss of the migrants and of the young adults. <coughs> let, me, let me conclude by just making some very um, brief comments. The thing about immigration in New Zealand, we spend a lot of time looking at it, is that it is a national immigration system. Leaving aside Canterbury, which has its own little um, uh, subset of the national immigration policies, it's a national immigration system. Now, you heard the Prime Minister announce on Sunday that the, um, there are going to be an increase in points. Uh, if you look at the points value at the moment, yes, over 100 you're considered, over 140 and you're in an elite group and are going to get approval to come to New Zealand, of which 30 constitute an incentive to come to a region like Taranaki. But really, my challenge is to you, because I think the way to respond to this, particularly in the future when immigration is going to be an important driver of both skills, economic growth, and population, what does a Taranaki immigration policy look like? I think the <coughs> regions, in this case Taranaki, needs to think about where it wants to go, the sort of people it wants to attract, and to develop something which is much more proactive, because a national immigration policy is not going to send you many immigrants. And you have a, you have a, a number of things which I think are very, very positive. The, f the most important thing for, uh, reason for immigrants coming to New Zealand is lifestyle. You have that in bucket loads. Why don't you make that a point of sale? Uh, why don't you include employers? I, in my experience, employers tend to be quite diffident about getting engaged in, in recruiting immigrants, but you could do much more, and of course you need to have um, a welcoming community. This province, because of out-migration and because of what's happened, particularly during the GFC, has a, a very significant diaspora, and let's include people onshore as well as people offshore. Why don't you draw on that diaspora to recruit people to come back They've got family here, they've got connections here. Why not use that as a selling point? But the other thing is, why don't you use the skills and the connections they have where they're currently living for your benefit? This country, to me, lacks an adequate diaspora policy. There are 800,000 New Zealanders living outside New Zealand at the moment. I don't know how 
how many of them come from Taranaki, but why don't you identify them and, and use them? Um, the third area really is to just to say um, skills policies, and um, Haley and one or two others heard my view on this before. Uh, we've been trying to work with employers around the country. I don't know whether employers in Taranaki are different, but trying to get employers to identify what their skill requirements are five years out is proving very, very difficult. So planning for future skill uh, and uh, changes to employment is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge in this country at the moment. And again, I think there's a really important role in, in regions like Taranaki to have coordinated approaches to this, a vision of where you want to go, and to make sure that you backfill. If you, were, if you came to us at Mass University and said, we want these because we anticipate a shortage in five years or 10 years, it's going to take us five to seven years to train and get those people ready for you. So it's not a one or two year or three year exercise. And really the final thing is to say, if you're going to see, as all regions are, if you're going to see this very significant increase from 14% of the population being over 65 to somewhere around 28 to 30% of your population over the age of 65, why don't you make that a positive? Why don't you actually say, this is a region in which we value those experiences, we use the capital that they've got, the skills that they've got, we plan for them, we, we make communities attractive for them, and we actually make it, again, a point of difference. We don't have, I was going to say any regions, that's probably a little untrue, we don't have many regions in New Zealand, or many cities in New Zealand, which are actually actively engaging with what's going to occur. So my far last slide is really just to say, um, the adjustment to the different age composition is new territory for all of us. It's never happened before in our history. And we used to talk about demographic um, pyramids. We don't talk about that. They are flat-sided these days. And if you're going to think about retaining population, encouraging population to come back, or encouraging migrants, then you do need to have a package which makes it attractive for them. And that does mean thinking about skilled labour supply. It does mean thinking about how we retain workers and retain businesses. And at the bottom of this, I think, is, as you heard in terms of my discussion of the uh, immigration policy, is that it needs a very clear vision and a very clear set of drivers and, uh, and a direction for a region to go because it is going to be difficult. There's no escaping that. And it's understanding the challenges and developing policies to answer it. And that task, all the very best. So the first thing today to say is do not despair if you have grey hair. Because I think the point that Paul made on the way through, of course, is that this needs to be not looked so much as a problem, but simply as a reality. This is happening to regions all around the country. If you are not in Auckland and you are not in, in Tauranga and Hamilton, you are not sharing in that rapidly growing population that's driven by migration and by New Zealanders shifting north to be part of that growth. You're part of the regions that are trying to think through what we should do about these kinds of issues. So it's a challenge for all of us below that triangle, and we need to come up with some broad answers. So to remind you why you're thinking of questions and things you might want to talk about again, the idea of stagnation, the idea of people over 65 growing in number, people under 15 being lesser in number, people leaving the area, creating issues around what you do about skills, the fact that some of the people who aren't staying are staying outside education and training and they're not in anything basically at the present time and there are a reasonable number of those kinds of people. There are people who have been migrating but of course that has stopped as the Australian boom has ground to a halt. That's meant people have been less willing to go there and look for opportunities here. That's both an opportunity and a, a change in what has been happening. There is that issue of how you address, how do you stand in, around the issues of Auckland and what people are doing there, how do you make yourself attractive and compelling, and compelling compared to that, and of course uh, Paul started to move towards, well there are some pretty concrete things that can be done by regions if they start to think of this as just the reality of the situation, not, not a problem to despair about, but what to do about it is becoming a very real pressure for us all. So a person who's been thinking a lot about that over the last little while is a social professor 
uh, Richard Shaw. Uh, Richard specializes in the area of politics, but has been speaking to people a lot over the last little while in regions about how they, as places that are trying to use politics, use their own institutions to cope with things like the issues of changing population, what they do about that, not just in New Zealand, this is a problem for people all over the world. Migration, changes in, in demography are problems for communities all around the world. So he's been looking at that and saying, how do you use your local institutions to try and respond to these kinds of issues? Please welcome Associate Professor Richard Shaw. Pro Vice Chancellor Paul Spoonley just handed me two and a half seconds ago north and south and said, hold this up. I'm holding it up. If you can't see the title, it's, it's a question mark. It's life better in a small town. And if you have read that, uh, I haven't read it, but I suspect that the answer is yes, it's in the affirmative. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why, why we're here. Uh, we'll come to that shortly. Um, Vice Chancellor, thank you for the introduction. It's lovely for me to be here. The last time I was here, I think it was in 1976, and Dave Marshall, who I think still has the whole food shop out on the main street. Yep, heads are going up and down. We're singing the lead role in Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, and Kim Taruki, who wound up marrying the man who's related to my Vice Chancellor, was dancing on that stage. Um, I'm, I'm from here. This is my this is my tour on the Waiwai, and it's lovely to be here for all sorts of reasons. The best reason is because at some point um, I get to go and hang out with my mum, who's also here at Back Beach. That was the primary reason for coming up and spending some time with you here today. Um, but there are other more compelling reasons why I'm here. Uh, and one of them takes the form of Hayley Radich, who's sitting down there. Uh, Paul and I have just spent three and a half hours with 41 of your future leaders from all of the high schools in New Plymouth and a number of the, uh, the high schools in the wider Taranaki region and the first of uh, Mass University's Young Leaders Symposia. And I have to say that um, looking around those 41 young people, some of them will go, uh, a number of them, of them will remain and some of them will come back. And you will be in exceptionally good hands. There are young people there of very, very high calibre, uh, and one of them will address you later on this evening. There is a particular reason why we wanted to have Hayley on the stage here. Um, one is that uh, Paul has referred to the silver economy, which I will be speaking about briefly. Uh, and you are, a number of you, amongst the wealthiest uh, and the healthiest people who have come through to that age group. But one of the reasons why uh, wealth has been redistributed to you is because people like Hayley are paying the price tag. Uh, there's another reason why we've got her here. Often in deliberations of this sort, we're an exception, I think, at Massey, but often in national deliberations around the distribution of life's burdens and its benefits, we marginalise, we dismiss, we ridicule, we downplay, we ignore the voices of our young people. It's a particular challenge for you in Taranaki, I think, given some of the statistics which Paul has rolled out. So I, um, we wanted to have a voice on the stage, laying out the well for you, setting down some of the challenges on, on the part of your young people, having that voice heard in the debates. So just to wrap that part up, the Young Leaders Symposium has unearthed some very, very fine young people in Taranaki, you're in good hands in that particular respect. Um, my job, and it will be a very brief job, is to, uh, is to amplify one or two of the points which Paul has made, and in particular to look around different parts of the world at things that other people who look a lot like you and whose regions and provinces face some of those similar, similar challenges have, have done. Um, there's a good deal that we can learn. Uh, there are some lessons that we can learn not to do, but there is a good deal that we can learn from what has happened in, in proximate or, or cognate populations around the world's regions and provinces, which and it's not for us to stand here and to declaim. Our job is really to say, here is some of what has worked and here are some things that don't work in regions, and towns and provinces which are facing some of the sorts of challenges that you are here. This is my mother, somewhere on Powder on the Street. After a round of golf, 18 holes out of the golf club, let me just choose three of the points which Paul has made to you. Uh, and then what I would like to do is just, uh, is just to reframe the challenges that are associated with an ageing population, not as costs or as risks or as threats, but as opportunities, economic, social and otherwise. So those are the broad parameters of the challenges which face you. It's that second point, really, which is the big take-home, right? Next year, there will be more people over the age of 65 in this city are people under the age of 15. And we are the first 
you will be the first place in New Zealand to or one of the very first places who tip over that particular demographic threshold. But to, the term the silver economy is gaining credits in New Zealand. There's not a huge literature on it. There's a very substantial literature on it internationally. And it refers to all of the spending on goods and services which is related to population ageing, both public and private. And you can slice those data up in different ways. But Merrill Lynch have done, um, I'm not sure they've led the pack necessarily, but they've done a really substantial amount of empirical work costing out the silver economy. And those are simply four points which I think are absolutely worth pausing and reflecting on. When we talk about, when we use aggregate statistical artefacts to wrap a story around the economy, we typically don't pull the silver economy out and wrap a ring around it and say, this is what it looks like. But look at it, it's huge. If you disaggregate economic data in the way that people who do research into the silver economy do, you will identify the world's third largest economy. The Vice Chancellor talked about the world's largest nation being on Facebook. The third largest economy in the world comprises that spending which is directed at population ageing. And in the United States, it's colossal. And in 30 years' time, it comprise 50% of all economic production in both Japan and the United States. So it's a very significant economic driver. It's not for me, because I'm not a business person and I am not located in this place anymore. It's not for me to uh, specifically identify individual businesses who might benefit from this. But Merrill Lynch's research gives you a fairly clear idea about the wide range of business opportunities which are variously presented by an ageing population. Those are just some of them. I would imagine that if we were to discuss this at any great length, you would add at least another one or two paragraphs of equal size. A number of you will work in service and other productive sectors which are plugging into the silver economy. Let me just take briefly a specific instance. You can't see it and I'm not going to play it, but there is a wonderful ad which is screened uh, on our TV screens which has a couple called it. It's not Frontier, so we can't play it actually, but it is a milk producing company, I think, and, and it's elderly flattened. And it's a, it's a humorous thing. I think it's humorous because it reminds me of things that I might have done 30 years ago. But actually, it's real. It is what people are increasingly doing. So let's talk about a specific part of the silver economy which presents a whole series of opportunities. We have a particular approach to housing in this country, and you will know what that story is. The narrative begins in the post-war period. It involves iconic figures of the first Labour government. It involves photographs of Savage Crescent. It involves pictures of Labour ministers carrying um, furniture into the first state home. It involves language like the quarter acre section and the quarter acre paradise and so on, but it doesn't work. Increasingly, for elderly people, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for people like Hayley either, I have to say, regardless of whether they live in Auckland or not. The notion, the, the, the myth, the creation legend of this country about home ownership is becoming increasingly a nightmare for people like Haley. And one of the reasons for that is because people like us have written the rules in our favour. That particular point aside, the housing model that we, we, we cleave to as part of our kind of creation myth doesn't really work for a great many people anymore. My mother, I suspect, is, is far better positioned than I am to talk to this. But the family home gets big. In this country, it gets cold. It gets expensive to maintain, it gets lonely, it can be physically isolating. So people look to alternative ways of living. And there is a good deal of research which has been done around different housing models. Quite a lot of it has been done, this is a nakedly self-instrumental blood, by people in my university and in my college, people like Fiona Halpas and Chris Stevens and Juliana Mansfield, you know, who are looking at alternative ways of configuring housing for elderly people, or at least for those elderly people for whom live life at Molly Ryan doesn't work. Clearly that works for a number of people. For other residents of uh, industrialised housing on that scale, those places become ghettos. So there are alternative housing models, and all I've done is I've just cherry-picked three or four um, examples of models which are taken from Fiona and Chris and Juliana's work as, as exemplars of different ways of constructing housing within the silver economy. Clearly, there are opportunities. There are costs, but there are opportunities in the construction sector there. The last but one slide is just a little bit of a leap ahead. Uh, and here I'm guided by uh, Venture Taranaki's most recent um, business conference report. And if you 
comments that were made in particular about connectivity and digital connectivity. You can read that for yourselves, but I think what is um, important to acknowledge is that the construction of alternative models of housing in the silver economy will fundamentally involve ICTs, information communication technologies and digital connectivities in particular ways. Those are, those are specific examples of why functional, accessible, fast, reliable ICT access is crucial to housing our elderly in different ways and therefore realising some of those economic opportunities. But here's what happens here. And this is just nicked straight out of Vincent Taranaki's reports. You all know, intuitively or otherwise, that it's good for business, very broadly defined, to have functional, reliable, regular ICT contact. But look at that. Only 24% of your 1,400 or 1,500 businesses have access to or log on via ultra-fast broadband. 19% still use dial up. I can't even remember the last time. <laughs> put, your, put your hands up if you are one of those 19 percent. And these are your figures and not ours. And 50 percent of those who are not using the UFB still haven't either considered it or shifted to it. Look, this is, this is a very poor example of social science research because I've completely constructed a specific optic on this. And many of you would test elements of that. I don't think you can contest the entire story though, because it comes out of your people. So this is what happens here. This is not entirely a function of decisions that are taken at Taranaki clearly. This is, a, this is an issue that has broader national ramifications. But I simply point that out to you by way of finishing just a little story, which is that your population is ageing. The, the, the national debate around ageing tends to focus on the cost dimension rather than the opportunity dimension. And we are well behind international debates in that particular way. In the OECD in particular, an ageing population has been completely pivoted and it has been almost entirely told as a positive story, as a series of economic opportunities. In order to realise those opportunities, at least two things <coughs> need, to be one, need to be done. One, we need to tell a very different story about housing in this country. And secondly, you really need to change that 90% statistic. There are a couple of quick comments to make about that. One is that whenever you go to anything in New Zealand, isn't it amazing how close uh, everybody is to each other? So Mrs Shaw, how did he do? Is that okay? Out of ten, he passed. I think you can be proud, it wasn't too bad. And those of you who were in Jesus Christ Superstar many years ago, there was a reunion after that. Down in the front here. So if you'd like to come forward, if my brother's wife is here, Kim, are you here? You could come and renew your acquaintance with, with Richard as well. That is one of the strengths, though, of our, of our communities, by the way. The fact that we do know each other and we can actually reach out to each other is extremely important because communities get rich because they are strong, not the other way around. So when you have communities where there are strong networks where people can talk to each other and reach out and sit together over a cup of coffee and work out issues, you get some progress. And one of the really strong things you notice about coming back and forth to New Plymouth over the last, what, 30 years of my life is noticing how proud people are of living here and how they know each other. Pretty simple thing, therefore, to start working out who's going to do what to try and move forward with some of these kinds of, of issues. Now, we've begun the process of, of looking at what Paul Spooner had to say uh, in the light of well, what, what are the ways we might begin to address this. And Richard's raised the idea that uh, being a, an economy with a, an older group of people doesn't mean there is no economy. Those people are not dead. They are people who are alive, they're healthy, they're living longer lives, and they form part of an economy and they can be part of it themselves. So there's a real plus that people are applying around the world. And there are opportunities that run around areas like ICT. The dial up, by the way, is not just for you. If you're all shocked and thought, gee, we're the only ones in the world, you know, I can't even get you at UFB where I live in Palms North because they haven't bothered to put it out there yet. So this is a problem common to us all. But if we stay with that, of course, we can't answer these kinds of problems. So we know that there are concrete things that that might be possible to do. So we're going to begin on the process then of just having a look at what are the answers. We'll include both Paul and Richard in their discussion as we go forward. But we're going to begin 
uh, our look at what we might do by turning our attention to Barbara Krieger, who I said before, uh, could not be here, the MP for uh, Taranaki King Country. I couldn't get leave today from the House, that's why Barbara's not here. But you'll know Barbara is not just an MP, she's also a hugely successful farmer and participant in the whole move towards an agri-food economy. She's been one of the leaders in that area, she's a tremendous person to be around, as you know. So we've got a message from her that we're going to start with. Good afternoon. Sorry I can't be with you today, uh, but it's a pleasure to be speaking you, to you anyway. Um, my large electorate goes from Toko to Narawahia, and I believe that we can either accept the dispersal of people out of the regions, or we can actually uh, move towards creating a stronger regional New Zealand, and I'm ambitious for some dynamic options. And the first thing I believe is um, that connectivity is important, so whether that comes to telehealth, skyping health, rural health close to the patient, it's around education, kids being able to go away and do their homework, it's about having technology for our businesses, it's about being networked to the world so people can come and live in the regions and, and still uh, communicate, and it's about having youth, because they, um, you know, technology, smartphones, they won't come to our regions unless they can uh, pull their phone, phones out of their pockets and communicate with their friends. I also think it's really imperative that we have coordination. Um, I know there's a lot of things we can do, grow and, and have in Taranaki King Country, but getting the scale to market is actually quite difficult, so we've got to deal with issues like our port um, and make sure that when we collectively put things together that we can actually get them out to the market. Um, we really need to have um, a lot more skilled people and I think it's collectives like uh, Taranaki Futures that are going to make a big difference to what we do because we've had lots of people knocking on teachers' doors but if we can put one solid sound point of resource and information, um, that would be great. Um, alignment between the employers and the skills, I've got a primary ITO background and we spend a lot of time discussing that in that industry. And also um, some changes to the immigration settings and you would have seen some changes around that over the weekend already, um, sending um, a signal that we would like people to come to the regions. We also need to make sure the infrastructure is good and it's great that uh, things are starting to move on the State Highway 3, uh, finally. and. Um, you know, more accommodation, I believe, particularly in my electorate around Waitomo Caves, would get that free flow between Taranaki and Waikato that we haven't been able to achieve uh, well in the past. And the other thing is, we've just got to look after our elderly people. You know, elderly people aren't actually that old anymore. They retire, they make great volunteers in the community, and they're the glue that hold us together. And so, you know, I think they're a large part of, in our community, so rather than treating them as a liability, I think they're one of our biggest assets. So thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I look forward to the outcomes of today. Thank you. In fact, I think we should ban the word elderly, don't we? Uh, as, as, as suggested by Barbara, because it doesn't mean a hell of a lot anymore. There are people probably sitting in the audience thinking, well, by definition, I'm supposed to be an elderly person, but actually I'm still doing everything I used to do. As you people say now, 90 is the new 40, so it's... it's, 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 it's oh, it's 60 is the new 40. I'm just going to help the 90-year-olds here. Now, I'm going to invite the rest of the panel up now to, to follow on from uh, what Barbara had uh, to say. A lot of ideas packed in there, so I hope you were hanging on to those. But let me invite the rest of the panel up here. Richard Williams, uh, CEO of Taranaki Chamber of Commerce. Would you like to begin uh, to head on up here? Uh, can I invite uh, Ryan Evans, editor of Taranaki Day News, who's a, a very local person, been here for a long time, and one of the trend towards young, feisty uh, editors of our so well, good to have you here, Ryan. Stuart Trundle, CEO of Venture Taranaki, who you know has been uh, leading Venture Taranaki here for a long time. And if you've been at Fora before with myself and Stuart, you will know that we uh, trace our uh, friendship back to the United Kingdom when we first met in a uh, strange place called Birmingham, where people have very weird accents. Not his, his one's quite recognisable. <laughs> and uh, Hayley Radich from Secret Heart Girls College, as you heard before, Hayley has been involved in the Young Leaders uh, Symposium because she's been identified as a young leader. Uh, this, I think, is one of the most important things that's happening around the country at the present time, is identifying young people and getting them into programs where they rapidly develop the kind of skills that those of us who are older in the audience here we wish that we could have had when we were at this age to get our uh, interesting careers on, on a, a much faster start than probably we, we did. So great to have you here, Hayley. Look, looking forward to hearing what you've got. 
got to say. Now, I've said uh, to each of the panellists, short, sharp, like this, just points that we want to, to hear, and then we want to get into a dialogue with you, and we'll open up for a conversation at that point. I'll, I'll ask Richard and Paul to join us on the stage as well. So, Richard, I know you were the, the uh, early ring-in for this, uh, but I'm sure, therefore, you're very fresh in your mind as to what you, you want to say today. So would you like to kick us off with your thoughts and reactions? Are we on here? Oh, yes, there we are. Um, yes, <laughs> just about my time this morning. I'm going to steal a company here. Um, look, the, the thing that we're seeing from the uh, Chamber of Commerce point of view is, you know, we, we're supporting the Taranaki Futures thing because, you know, the youth and engaging kids not to go into the holding pen, and I mean this in, in, the, in, the, in the nicest possible way, the holding pen of university because that's the only option. And um, what we want to do is see them engage. If universities for them, fine, absolutely fine, move on. But don't go there just because it's there. And I think there's probably a bit of a case of, of my generation, our generation, that thinks that's the way to go. And I think with the Taranaki Futures that we're looking at and saying, actually, trades and things that we need to take the future forward here, whether it be trades, IT, all those things that we're listing out here, this is what we've got to push for. Because if, you know, commercially, Taranaki is going to succeed and grow again in the future it is those people coming through yeah to look after the aging population who are providing as we said there an industry industry in itself so you know the the, the economy is strong it's a very broad base economy we're looking at at the moment underpinned by the two areas of obviously white gold and uh, and black gold but we know there's that green gold which is our tourism which is massive potential here and we really see that growing i think that's something we really need to push at and the Maori economy, we've got to think of that. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce is actually trying to engage with Maori business because that's, that's again, that's a massive area open for uh, for business and, and to make Taranaki great. So that's really where we're coming from. Okay, great. So if you were catching points there, we're talking about young people leaving university as a choice, uh, but they may go to university. One thing to think about too, which many regions are doing, is how to get a university into the region, obviously. No one's going to fund a major new university because you're under age already. But can universities be in a region? There's an interesting uh, process going on in Tauranga, for example, where they're bringing a university into a kind of relationship with one a high tech university in the region. So, but you're saying trades, tourism, Maori economy, there are many options that are right here at the present time. Okay, Ryan, can we move to you to hear what you first got to say? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I just have to say, I, I was. Uh, Initially, a little uh, daunted being asked to come onto this panel, and um, sitting up here now, I'm uh, perhaps even more so. <laughs> um, um, look, I wouldn't have considered uh, economics to be a, a strong point of mine, um, so preparing for this has, um, has been um, something, uh, it's been interesting for me. And I, I started by discussing um, economics with some of my colleagues at work. Um, one of the older heads uh, told me that uh, back in the day he could uh, accurately predict how the economy, how Taranaki's economy was going uh, simply by looking at the classified ad sales. And uh, I know that he actually uh, impressed uh, former Prime Minister Helen Clark with that um, little nugget of information. Um, I don't think his methodology would uh, quite hold true in today's world with Trade Me, Seek, um, Facebook and Murray and other changes. But um, I, I guess I guess that's what I see as the whole point of uh, today's today's presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a stock take of our world um, and how the economy and the conditions have changed and the challenges and realities that we face. Um, so uh, I work in an industry where I, I don't I don't know if there'd be an industry, um, or certainly be one of the most challenged um, of, of all the industries out there. Um, so I'm pretty proud that I work for a company that has um, that has said, right, we do have to change how we do things, and we have to uh, look to be part of the new the way the world is going, and that's not without some pain. Um, and I guess that that's the situation that Taranaki is finding itself in too. Um, we've all just heard, heard the presentations, looked at the data, and um, I think the message is, is that uh, we have to change to prepare for this future. Um, I just thought I'd touch on one of the points, and that was um, that was immigration, and it's a it's a a topic that's pretty popular for the for the media, 
and I guess that's because whenever it comes up, um, it, it arouses people's passions. Um, it gets people talking. Um, what that says about uh, New Zealand as a society, um, I, I don't know, but I think you only need to look recently at uh, the topic of um, Chinese house buyers in Auckland to see just how that debate can, uh, can, can get pe under people's collars. Um, I think here in Taranaki, as a wider community, um, we, we sort of regard this place as our own little secret to, to some extent, um, one that we're not always willing to share with the world. But um, the reality of what we've listened to today says that uh, that's something that we are going to have to uh, increasingly try to share. Um, from a personal perspective, um, I've, I'm strongly believe in accepting immigrants and immigrations in, in an immigration. Um, my own family is strongly linked to uh, to immigration, um, and I have seen from them uh, the the drive and the desire to help build and grow that immigrants bring. Um, we're really going to need them here, and soon I think, um, more than just accepting, accepting them, we're going to think have to think about how we can attract them. Um, we're probably lucky here in Taranaki, we have had um, leaders who have um, already recognised that importance, and I guess that's through doing things um, Lifestyle-wise, things like the coastal walkway, um, most recently the, uh, the Len Lai Centre that we opened on Saturday, um, to things like building a successful rugby team that uh, immigrants might want to come here and support. So, are the kind of uh, are the kind of uh, facilities and things that I think that people um, make make this a place where people want to come. Um, but I still know from personal experience just how difficult it can be to attract um, a, a skilled worker here to Taranaki. Um, how our perceived isolation, I guess, can count against us um, when trying to attract staff. So I have been encouraged by a couple of things that I've seen. Um, I know uh, Barbara, I think, alluded to it, um, about the role that the government will play. Um, Paul, I think, mentioned it as well, um, in terms of trying to attract those meat migrants um, outside of Auckland and to the regional centres. But I don't think that here in Taranaki we're the kind of people that will uh, sit back and say, well, that's good, the government will look after it for us. Um, and nor should we be. We need to roll up our sleeves and get them here. I guess where I see this fitting in, uh, uh, where I see my organisation fitting in, is that as a community, um, we're going to need a fundamental rethink about how we, about immigrants and immigration and how we get these people here. Um, so I know the importance of the role that my organisation plays in having and understanding that debate um, and the cultural societal shift that, um, that probably needs to occur. Um, I think it'll be a challenge, but I think from what we've heard today, it, uh, I think we can all take away that it's a challenge that we can't afford to ignore. So, from a perspective of an organisation that's obviously had a couple of change itself, what you're arguing is that the, the region ought to be focusing on changing itself so it becomes more attractive to migrants who would not step in Auckland but choose to come here. That would be your central point. Now. Yeah, I think so. I think we need to look at what we do and you know, we've, we've seen that we're going to need um, immigration and uh, so we need to think about what we do to, to get them well, speaking of migrants, can we swap to uh, Stuart and see what you would do from uh, um, Vice Chancellor and Distinguished Professors Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kata. Um, I'm rather concerned when we talk about grey hair when you actually have no hair whatsoever um, on, on how you can comment on these issues. What, what I do always want to do when you look to the future is actually examine the lessons from the past. Um, some of you viewer were aware that some of my history was actually driving a very large passenger liner. Uh, and that actually is ideal training to help in regional economies because actually, unlike some yachtsmen who get in front of a superliner shaking their fist asking you to change course, we actually would take over two hours to actually stop the thing. And it would actually take us um, over six minutes before the, 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 the bow actually started moving 
after we push the rudder over. Um, if in doubt, watch the movie Titanic for the lesson of this. Um, when I then moved ashore, I was in an unfortunate position of actually guiding some former Soviet republics on getting their economies going. And on the first meeting um, with the Prime Minister, only 10 days after the Soviet tanks had um, pulled out of the city centre, I actually asked what had happened to the former economic advisor to be told they'd just been shot. Um, so I am mindful, Vice Chancellor, those key performance measures have really influenced the way I approach the role of venture Tabernaki. Um, then just to reassure Ryan, um, economists are like weather forecasters. You probably only get it right 10% of the time. The good news is you still get paid, Ryan. Um, but I think the important message there is trying to predict the future, sometimes based on past statistics, and especially a census from 2006 to 2013 can present challenges. Um, the first point was from 2006 to 2013, Kalamaki, from the ages of 0 to 13, actually exceeded the New Zealand average. What does that demonstrate? Well, it demonstrates two things. A, we're having far more fun here in the evenings than any other part of the rest of the country. It's also encouraging the younger ones in the audience. Can I encourage you to go home this evening and breed madly? Because the secret will always be population. Uh, and, and for the over 60s, I also encourage you to go home and have fun this evening because uh, it may not result in quite the same outcome, but you will be one of the happiest locations for people to come to. The other thing is, it should always be informed by strategy. Uh, at the end of the day, great deeds come where there's a plan, and that plan should be in, in engaged by strategy. Um, about five years ago, over 3,000 people in Taranaki took part in the regional economic strategy. And I stress region, not a district. Um, yet, in OECD terms, a population of 100,000, correct me, Professor, is still called a village. And I sometimes forget that the village of Taranaki identified uh, a number of outcomes. One, if we were to achieve our economic growth objectives, we would need a population of 135,000 by the year 2035, point one. Point two, we actually called it the demographic time bomb um, back in 2010. Uh, and partly, and the present company accepted, we were getting old and knackered uh, as a community. But it is a time bomb because it's ticking away below the surface. Uh, and occasionally, with time bombs, everybody else expects somebody else to defuse it as you head for the hills and head for cover. Um, I think Venture Tabernacle were bold enough to actually say we'll confront that challenge. Uh, and as a result, um, we now have over 1,100 employers working on the Taranaki talent strategy. And we don't call it skills because actually the economy needs a talented community. It needs talented people wanting to retire here. It wants talented people to come to be educated and to come back here. And I think the key thing about talent, talent isn't just about competition with Auckland. We're in a global talent quest where actually, for people in the energy sector, it's about Perth, Aberdeen, or New Plymouth. In the dairy industry, it's where do we go to actually have successful careers. For entrepreneurs, where's the capital flow, and where do we want to be? And again, international research informs us that today, talent wants to go to cool cities, cool locations. And if I've got a criticism for civic leadership, I think we made a mistake with the building next door of describing it as a contemporary art gallery. Because actually, that's part of a strategy to actually ensure we have a cool community with cool walkways, cool opportunities across all age groups, all, um, all interest groups, where innovation, creativity is celebrated. And whether that's the operatic society, this building, it's about the creativity in this room. This is where visions become reality. And if I can challenge, it is about our future. Our future isn't what um, policymakers or governments define. It's actually what each and every one of you goes home tonight and defines you want for your family and whanau. 
what do you want for the next generation? And not only the next generation, but the generations to come. And I celebrate in Taranaki, Victorian thinking meant there was a degree of investment in infrastructure, the port, the breakwater, the roading infrastructure. It wasn't for today, it was for somebody else's benefit. And I think we've lost, actually, as a community, a sense of some of that philanthropic thinking around, actually, there's nothing in it for you, ladies and gentlemen. What there is, is for the children, the grandchildren, and future generations. So, I am actually tremendously encouraged um, by the younger generation that's, that's coming through. They are our future. If anything, I think we've stuffed it up a bit for a generation. And now it's time to start putting some of these things correctly in place. But it needs a unity of leadership. Um, you could be uh, observing we have a great deal of leadership in Taranaki, but it is about getting everybody on a common purpose, a common agenda, and then actually we become really quite dangerous. But the other lesson in OECD is regional development actually ultimately <coughs> ends up with devolution of decision making. Divestment of budgets and decision making to local communities because if that was the case, actually we wouldn't have waited over 50 years to get a bit of tarmac to the north sorted out. Um, we wouldn't be worrying about the future of our polytechnic. We wouldn't be worried about health care because we would actually be in control of our own destinies. Thank you. It's been fantastic way you first I told you to do this. I think it is worth saying, I've said this before, it's much to Stuart's embarrassment, but I've spent a lot of years around economic development issues at a local level. I think in this country, Stuart is the best person I know of in this area. So you're very lucky to have the kind of leadership and talent you do have scattered around here. Other people as well through the region, but I think Stuart is a, is a local treasure really for, for this kind of issue. So thanks for that insight, so Stuart. You mentioned on the way through uh, leadership and young people. I went to a forum many years ago where the young people stood up and said, you keep referring to us as the future. We aren't the future, we're actually the present, we're here now, and we want to actually do things right now, which I guess is what you're doing, Hayley, because you're in this leadership program and thinking about what you want to see the community be now. So can we finish off with your comments? Yes. Um, my name's Hayley Redditch. I'm a Year 12 student at Sacred Heart, and I'm a member of the School Student Council. And so tonight I'll be representing the voice of 40 other young leaders across Taranaki who have voiced together their opinions at the Young Leaders Symposium. And my job is to represent their views on some of the key issues facing Taranaki youth. Um, I'd like to identify four key issues that emerged from today's symposium and put forward a series of responses to these issues that we came together this afternoon. My first point is that we lack a university presence in our region. We are aware of the important roles played by other tertiary institutions, but we find that the absence of a university gives young people every incentive to leave Taranaki to find education elsewhere. We feel that there are three possible solutions for this issue. One, a smaller branch of an existing university in Taranaki. Two, business scholarships offered in return for jobs in Taranaki. And lastly, clearer information offered to youth about the tertiary options that we presently have in Taranaki. Um, young people in Taranaki have very strong views on the issues surrounding youth suicide. We often feel that our paths are being determined by others, and in difficult economic times we feel under great pressure to find work. We think to help us deal with these issues, older people have a responsibility to mentor and support young people and to pass on their wisdom and knowledge and to acknowledge that we as young people are not all the same. Thirdly, as young people, we are concerned about the extent to which a lack of income means some young people are excluded from full participation in the community. We would like to see scholarships offered to underprivileged students and processes to allow different voices to be heard in the our final concern is that two of Taranaki's main sources of income and employment are not sustainable, and we fear that there will be fewer and fewer jobs offered to us when the time comes for us to enter the workforce. 
The success of the dairy and oil industries depends on the global economy. And we would like to see alternative sources of employment supported in our region. We support the emphasis on profiling tourism and we look forward to an increase in job opportunities in non-traditional areas. We think that it's important for today's leaders to seek out the opinions of tomorrow's leaders. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share these views with you this evening. Fantastic. Uh, those are four very crystal uh, issues that I see in the minds of, of young uh, people and some suggestions about how they might be addressed. So, um, if you two can manage to get up there, you're okay. As you see, you're getting older. This is the issue. Right. Um, so this, this is our panel, this is the time for us to open up to questions, comments, anything that you might want to have gone back over, things you want to, to tease out from the, the people who are here at the front. I'm just vamping at the moment because I'm getting to look around to see who might put their hand up and say I'm going to kick us off for the first question. So anybody like to just begin the conversation by saying, it doesn't have to be a question, the comment's fine, the question will be good. If you ask a question, nice and short, so we can get through lots of them, and maybe direct it to the person or persons that you would like to hear uh, the opinion from. Okay, so who would like to uh, start us off with a question? Um, uh, just for, um, oh, okay. If you have a very loud voice, it's not a huge room, just go for it. <laughs> if you've got a quiet voice, wait, wait for the microphone then. Uh, you just for Stuart, just wanted to know if you're not looking to invest in a house, what do you think the next best investment would be? I'm personally my children. Um, <laughs> I, I think it really is important that sometimes we get too um, confined with assets that are around us. I, I think there's another challenge for this community, and it's inequality. Um, and, and I think looking around this room, we're very fortunate. Um, but we need to be mindful there are the others that are less fortunate than ourselves. So I, I think it's actually investing in others. Okay. To... Yeah. Feel free to just signal because I'll stack you up. <laughs> okay, my uh, question is for Hayley. I, I really do appreciate what you said in terms of asking us for help, in, in specifically around mentorship and assistance. Uh, I know personally from having seen a, ver a variety of different CVs and how badly they're written, I can see why various children don't get the opportunity to even get an interview. So building on that, I'm wondering what ideas maybe you've already discussed with your community about what exactly it is and how we might go about helping you. Um, I think it would be very good to have something set up in the school system. Like, I know that a lot of schools have counsellors and things like that, but just put in more effort towards the youth and like give them someone to talk to and things like that just yeah okay thank you so we'll be approaching the headmasters and headmistresses by the sound of things thanks Richard Henry, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of listening to you today. I am particularly interested in the emerging uh, new slogan for Taranaki, Taranaki, old but not knackered. Thank you. Um, I, don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> you saying Taranaki more than you expect, so <laughs> leave, leave that to him. Thank you. Um, um, you spoke of, uh, several of you spoke of the need for improved regional development. And I wonder whether some of the recent signs are pointing towards that. Um, perhaps the election in Northland, perhaps some recent uh, announcement from the recent National Party Conference. So what, what is the view of the panel towards how we um, can look uh, to national politics or national government policies to assist us in improving regional development? whole panel or any in particular, Richard? I think there's several there who touched on okay, it, so uh, certainly Richard did, and I think, I think the other Richard did too. And Paul Stuart certainly did. He just passed the microphone over. <laughs> uh, over 30 per cent of all members of the New Zealand Parliament come from Auckland, uh, and more than a 
and 30% of the current cabinet comes from Auckland. So if you subscribe to the view that politics is innately an exercise in self-interest, I don't subscribe to that view. But I think the, the, it is worth thinking about the size of Auckland as a political engine. We, Stuart quite rightly draws attention to questions of inequality. Uh, in fact, Hayley and her colleagues spent a good deal of time talking about that this morning or this afternoon. One of the forms of inequality we don't talk about frequently is political inequality. And that can be sliced in a variety of different ways. But the, the, the institutional arrangements <coughs> in our unitary state are such that Auckland increasingly exercises a substantial dominance over policy setting. There are economic imperatives and there are structural imperatives. Um, so, so your challenge, the challenge that we face in the Manawatu too, and you face up here in Taranaki, and they certainly face in the Hawke's Bay, where we've also been, is just getting your voice heard in those institutional environments. So I, I agree with you, Richard. There are, there are clear and present signs of a, a slight pivot on the part of the present administration, but it's into its third term. So there has been, and time is ticking, and time has been ticking for quite some considerable period of time. It has taken a reasonable amount of time for this administration to reach a point where it's starting to alter some of those policy settings. And then there will be external lags as well before they start to take effect. So I'm right in, in detecting evidence of a, a shift. I certainly wouldn't call it a groundswell. And there remains the political inequality between the machine that is Auckland and the rest of the nation. It always pains me to use an Australian case study, but um, Australia was quite assertive a few years ago of actually deciding that they would invest in organisations called RDAs, regional development agencies across Australia. And what I actually quite liked, they gave them a strap line, and that strap line was nation building. Uh, and I think it was an understanding that underneath it all, it is the regions that will create a national well-being. Um, metro economies uh, uh, will always tend to create their own critical mass, but they did acknowledge that there needed to be interventions. Those interventions were empowered by local communities and were funded, because at the moment the regional strategy is actually just that. We will enable communities to create a strategy, and I believe yours is being launched tomorrow. The challenge perhaps you may wish to ask tomorrow, Vice Chancellor, is then the action plan and the investment strategy alongside it. Because a, a regional policy without actually a regional investment budget um, is rather challenging as to who, who actually ends up paying. Okay. Uh, Richard, I, I think there's um, some challenges. And if you look at our education or health policies, they are population-based. So if your population is stagnating, uh, I, I think it will grow a little bit, but if it's stagnating, then it's, it, it's relative position to other parts of the country. Let's take Canterbury or you know, some other regions. Um, uh, Bay of Plenty is actually growing. Then you're going to have to fight very, very hard for a diminishing pool of money. Um, and I just want to, to clarify one thing, and that is that Auckland per head of spend is one of the lowest spends in the country. And the government has a difficulty in that if it's going to keep infrastructure as a, as a key aspect of regional um, support going, the difficulty is that it's actually going to have to take money from Auckland to cover off regional spends. And while that, you know, um, recently I was, I was involved in a discussion down in Otago, and, and, and their argument is, the government spending too much money in Auckland, proportionate to the population, it's not. It's actually underspending, and you can see that in, in transport. So I, th I think the uh, I'm with Stuart on this. I think the the drive needs to come from the regions. You need to have a clear vision. You need to have a clear strategy. And 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 if you sit there waiting for the government to change things, you're going to be sitting there a very long time. Uh, yes, just picking up on a couple of the points there, um, from our point of view, I think looking at uh, the way the region is, I just want to do probably a little bit like Stuart, done, just go back a while. Um, when I first hit the workplace myself, I was in a wonderful place called uh, Liverpool, like, you know, and at that time it was in the 70s when, uh, I could have possibly been that long ago, but we had a city that was rapidly declining, um, the port was shot to pieces, um, nobody wanted to go there, it was just a horrible place and uh, it was just known for the music and that was it. Um, 
And then it got hold of itself in the 90s. Now, I hadn't been there for quite some time, and I was there to work back there for 12 months last year. This is one of the coolest cities you can go to in the UK now. Absolutely tremendous turnaround. It's got an unbelievably thriving port. It's got, it developed its what was a pretty small, uninteresting um, uh, airport. Into now it's called John Lennon International, and it's a great airport. They recited everything, new control towers, everything there. They've actually relocated the rail line so that can attach to it quickly. It's just E, they uh, had an internal system. Now it's a big city, we know this. It recently hosted the Three Queens, um, and it was just unbelievable to see it on, on TV to see it. So, what it was, they actually came together with a plan. They had government assistance eventually, because it started off with a garden city, then it became a cultural city. Then they developed the city centre, the CBD. They had huge investment into the CBD, they promoted retail, promoted businesses there. They've got three or four universities, promoted excellence of universities, and actually became known now as their centres of excellence there. And this is picking up uh, on the Vice Chancellor's point that if we actually had centres of excellence here, given our knowledge that we've got, a knowledge base of the greying economy, if I want to use it, are uh, in dairy. We know I've hosted people who come to this place who are looking to improve dairy. I think the Philippines was one in particular, and they were amazed that there was actually nowhere they could really go and really, really, really send people to learn about the dairy business. Okay, it's a business, not looking cows, it's a business. We know the same for tourism, we know the same with oil and gas, we've got tremendous knowledge. So if we started to develop and put a plan together that will actually look at what we need for the future, but also look at what we've got here, we can have make a tremendous change to, to this, this city. Not let it get like Liverpool did when it just actually did collapse, but actually make it what Liverpool on a much smaller scale is because we've got a great port that can be used. We could have cruise liners coming in and out of here. There's no reason at all why they couldn't come and visit the Lenlai. There's no reason why they couldn't come do tourism. Tourists actually like to spend money. So let's start charging for some of these things. Not to the locals, but the tourists. They love spending money. They want to spend money. Bring them in here. We've got an airport that's sitting there. There's one of the closest points to Australia. We've already put a case in for Jetstar. They need to come here. We need to get more flights around the country. Connect with Auckland, which is where the market is. Um, it's only a 30, 40 minute flight now. If we extended that runway, it's only about 450 metres, I think. And you can start taking small jets. Suddenly, okay, there may be fewer flights, but there's more people coming in per flight. So it suddenly becomes a cool, funky place. And I think it's incumbent on ourselves at the Chamber and other organisations to put together this regional plan to say this is what we're going forward. And then, you know, the likes of Haley and, and my children as well, who I've got three of them, and none of them are in New Plymouth, none of them are even in New Zealand at the moment, to drag them back because it's a cool place to come to. Okay, so that was a big question. I'm going to go over here and then come back here. Just touching on uh, Haley's point, what's, you know, what's the key doing to look at getting more involved here locally? Because for me, my kids would get to leave, they'd have to go home with their grandparents and pass the north. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my step, sir. Yeah. Just touching on Stuart's point, that's really where our focus now is if we pay off more of our mortgage, would we put more away to say for the ever increasing cost of sending our kids to university? We can keep them here, they can also still be working and Yep, I think the answer is that we can only do it as revenue. All of us are the same, we have to pay for what we to do. What we're doing in Hawke's Bay at the moment is, is a, an example of what you might want to do here, and that is that we are talking with the local council, who also have the local university and wanted one for a long time, about an education precinct. Uh, that would not just be us, it would be other uh, parts of the education system would be part of that precinct. They will set it up, they will run it, that will make it viable for people to move into uh, the Hawke's Bay region <coughs> and they'll get their, their local choice of at least that sort of beginning phase of, of people wanting to, to do their first year at home before they move. That's cheaper to do, it gets them uh, some sort of association with their local community. You can start the internship idea with people getting access uh, to jobs before they have to go away to finish off their degree. It does take a partnership and certainly the university is open to that. That's partly why it is in the local region. But it does take that kind of cooperation because no one's in a position these days, they're not funded, no educational institution is funded to simply do more. They're funded only what they can earn to do. So it has to be that kind of local partnership and certainly 
where I put to that. Thank you for that question, and I'd be very happy to have the kids come and stay. Can I just, can I just add uh, a couple of comments and elaborate on that? I think there, are, there is a small matter of the fact that we have 50 years' worth of experience of distance education, so we, we know what we are doing pedagogically in designing and delivering courses at a distance. There was also a, a challenge for you, I think, which is to, you, to put a different adjective in front of the word infrastructure. Uh, we talk increasingly in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences about intellectual infrastructure. So you will know the extent to which um, you you have the production of physical goods and services, and that's a substantial part of the, the, ro the local economy here. But there is also um, no doubt, I think, that you are moving into an era in which intellectual infrastructure, the value add that comes from the application of human imagination and ingenuity, will be fundamental. Some of that stuff can be pointed at dairy and at oil, but it can be pointed in all sorts of other ways as well. So, and what universities are very, very good at doing is complementing other tertiary education providers by attending to intellectual infrastructure. People like Haley will be doing five or six jobs, and most of those don't exist. So there is absolutely not no, but a limited point in training her for excellent jobs, because she's unlikely to be doing those jobs. They will either be, have been substantially modified, or they literally will not exist any further. So the presence of the university, either in the form of a precinct or in the form of a closer relationship through distance education, is the critical way in which you can add to the intellectual infrastructure of your region. Good argument. Um, now, I'm glad we've got an absolute tsunami of uh, people wanting to chat, and I want to get you out to mix and mingle. So I'm going I'm to do five, and we're going to see how anxious we are after that for, for more questions and more chats. Over here. Kia ora tātou. This question is for either Paul, Richard and Stuart. Um, I'm thinking about the new economies in Taranaki and specifically the recent treaty settlements. How might that contribute to Taranaki? What do you see as being the opportunities moving forward? And specifically as a community, how we can prepare for that to be able to participate? Can, can, can I start and then hand over to the locals? Because I think that's a game changer. Um, but I'm a, I look at the demographics and the thing that you I haven't mentioned but which I do now want to mention is that the people that look like me have an average age of in Taranaki of 42, Māori it is 21. So when we look at the uh, cohorts that are coming through uh, of uh, um, Haley's age or younger, they're increasingly going to be Māori. So there's, it's not simply that the, the, the economic power of iwi in a post-treaty um, settlement environment is going to be changed in a way that we haven't experienced in the past. But your demography, particularly the demography of the younger age and cohorts of this community, is actually going to change as well. And I should have mentioned that. I really appreciate this opportunity for everyone to come together like this, and thank you to Mass University for bringing this issue to light. Um, I, I'm really quite interested, especially since, Ryan, you brought up the point of immigration. I'm a migrant to this country. Um, being from San Francisco, we're dealing with a lot of these issues of immigration and changing demographics. I'm curious on how this panel is thinking about possible, and I'm not saying it exists, but possible issues of xenophobia um, in education, in politics, in the work industry. Um, so how would you suggest, when you're looking at demographic change, how do you prepare for that? Because in California, it's rampant. Racism, xenophobia, it's, it's everywhere. So this is an opportunity, as you have said, so nicely that this is a, a terrific opportunity for us to prepare for a lot of the issues that you might want to cope with that will come about because of changing demographics. Well, look, uh, just one of the things that I thought um, when I was preparing my uh, my remarks was that I, I guess it's about that change and it's about um, having the debate and recognising that actually um, bringing migrants and migrants into the region is, is a positive so that we need to look, we need to be able to look at them and look at the people of different cultures coming in and say we have to embrace these cultures um, and that's a cultural societal shift for, uh, that New Zealand has to go through and um, so that's what I think is, 
is important to your local paper, by a rather than. Yeah, um, three things. I think there needs to be leadership. People need to be telling others inside and outside this community that you're open for business. And it's, it needs to be a positive message. The second thing is your organisations and communities need to understand how to engage and welcome immigrants. We, I wrote, uh, I and a couple of colleagues wrote a paper for Cabinet a few years ago on social cohesion. And we wanted to say, what, what would you do to invest in migrant adaptation? Let's say to Taranaki. But we also said to the Cabinet, what should Taranaki do to adapt to migrants? Um, and there's a third thing which is completely, oh I know, um, the VC and I are involved in the Asian New Zealand Foundation and they're doing some wonderful work and the thing that I would just stress here is that if you want to deal with attitudes and make them positive, contact is the one thing that makes a difference. To some degree that problem I think will go away when Haley is 25 and 30 and 35 and it connects with the point that you made over there. We've noticed a very substantial change in the courses that Pung the Fenua students are enrolling in. They used to come to us and do social service courses and now they go and do business or they do science or they do agri-food and they are much, much, much more confident because they've been through the Kura movement and they've been through the, through the Kohanga Nau, but mostly they've been through a public secondary school system in which, which the Treaty of Waitangi in its various manifestations is just kind of given. It's a given, it's part of it now, which wasn't necessarily the case. So my, my, my positive take on this look at my two daughters is that uh, the, the challenges of difference and diversity are substantially addressed now in a generational sense in ways which might not have been the case previously. Over a drink. Uh, just going back to the uh, question of education, based on the premise that the future of a, of a country depends upon an educated population, putting aside uh, possibly bringing universities to the province, how can we better make use of what we've already got here in terms of education facilities? Well, um, just in response to what we were talking about before, I, I just wanted to say that I, I don't think that necessarily um, Having young people leave the province for a period period of time is a bad thing. Um, I'm perhaps unique on this panel in that I uh, was raised in Taranaki, went away to university, and have come back to live here, um, to live and work here. So I, I don't think that it has to be about jealously holding on to, to every single person. I think you want your young people to be able to go out and uh, experience the world. Um, experience uh, education that doesn't always come um, in, a, in a formal schooling environment, um, but I think the trick is that you want them to be able to come back. Do you want to comment? Because I think you touched on this point yourself in your earlier comments. The, on the point of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the training and things. Now, from, from I, I just think that what we've got to do is, is look at what we what we're really good at, and I know what we're good at in this, uh, in this province is A, being um, very supportive and uh, looking at things, but I think we can also get uh, a thing from our ageing population, as I said before, to really look and part of what I say, whether it's precincts or centres of excellence, but it's really just looking and tapping into that part of it too therefore create the knowledge base that is then passed on through and start to look forward a little bit. And I just think it's just something of working collegially on this particular point without necessarily having a, a massive edifice or big building somewhere. Okay, now I promised we'd do five and then we'd go and mix and mingle and get stuck into talking with each other. So I've got ten questions. So <laughs> I, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you two. It's a, it's a sort of balanced male-female. And then you're going to be very short and very short answers, and then we'll round off and let you get, get into a conversation with each other. So, Kia ora tato, rauranga tira ma tēnā koutou katoa, Kim Skelton, Tō Kuingua, nō Tia Tiawa, Taranaki, tēnā koutou. Um, firstly, I'd like to mihi to uh, Massey University for putting on this forum today. It's been uh, quite illuminating. Um, there, there were some statistics spoken of earlier. 
um, I wanted to make a comment then. I was at the launch of the Te Tirohanga Whānui Māori Business Barometer Hui in uh, Wellington two days ago, and the Māori business community and iwi leaders were speaking there of this, the biggest challenge being that demographic of young Māori under 20 um, will be the taxpayers of the future, and yet they are the most unskilled part of our population. So tēnā koe Paul for mentioning that at the end. We will, our children will be paying the pensions and the health care of those um, over 65s in the near future. So that is a challenge for all of Aotearoa. Um, I want also mihi to Hayley, a tēnā koe. Your speech was fabulous. I've noted down your points and I'll be watching out for you in the future. Um, and good luck with everything. I hope that Massey takes up your offer and sets up here so that you don't have to leave home. Because our Māori uh, tamariki are also wanting to stay at home. It's more affordable for them to live at home and to do their tertiary education here. And we need them to grow our community. Uh, finally, my partai is uh, to the demographers, perhaps, uh, the researchers at Massey. The diaspora um, caught my uh, attention and the research is that available on what is working to attract our best and brightest home and for me it will be about attracting Atiawa and Tamaki Whanui back to live here. Kia ora. Yes it is. Um, Paul Hamer has been doing some work on the Māori diaspora because of course it's not Auckland, it's Australia where they, uh, a large group of them live. Um, we, we don't have a very good um, fix on what would work because we haven't spent much time on it as a country. We've tended to see people who go overseas as sort of abandoning us in some way. And if you look at other countries, the Philippines would be a classic case where they have a government department which manages their overseas um, diaspora and it does a supremely good job. And it not only uses... I mean, there's a remittance thing that goes on, but the, um, not only uh, is it a income flow, but it's a skills flow. And so you're part of that now. The, the Filipinos coming into the dairy industry here will be part of a Filipino diaspora, which I wish we had something approaching. Final question in here. Kia ora tato. Um, just want to sort of try and properly offend the entire panel in some way equally so that they take something away from it. Um, Really, in terms of um, the, the, the key thing, and thank you, Massey, is, is the, the, um, the humanity side of it, which is what you've come to talk to us, which has been fantastic. But I think the key statistic that you left out was that at the end of the day, New Zealand as an entity of people is what, 0.06% of the global population. And I think that is the most important one to remember for New Zealanders because that sets the stage. And then I think the other thing, um, Ryan was talking about his business facing certain challenges. I think it's probably second to the challenges that have been faced by the education institutions because what my kids can now do on Google used to take me five days in a library at Auckland University. And so they've already got the jump on me. Don't tell them that they have. Um, and so then you come through to things like you were talking about innovation and capital flows. It's really important to have those because at the end of the day, someone has to pay for all these things that we would like. And I think that's something that is currently missing in our province, is how we attract and get there. And then, in talking to the to the old boys on the, on the up there, um, if you go back in history and talk, and I wasn't there, I'm not quite that old, if you look at Taranaki's history of Māori here, pre, um, pre really the settlement, and the amount of trade and commerce that they were doing is actually quite stunning. And I think as a region, Taranaki already has that fantastic history. What we have to do is, is make sure that we have the ambassadors going out and bringing in the, the uh, Kim, Kimball Bents and all of these other weird people that come in who are silly enough to want to cross huge distances of water to get here in the first place. If they make that trip, they're welcome. Right? And I think that the, the thing for Haley is the most important thing that we have to have in Taranaki to make it a good province is the right attitude because that will actually determine the outcomes and, and the responses to the things.
things that we have. So I hope that I've, other than Haley, I hope I've uh, met my objective of making those comments. Um, I think it's really good to have this here, so thank you. Someone like to take offence and round this off? <laughs> well, I was sick of offence. Perhaps if I could put a challenge out. Um, if we accept that low interest rates may be the short or medium term outlook, as a community, whether those are EWI settlements or indeed investment funds of local authorities, we have actually hundreds of millions of dollars that in many instances we're investing offshore in helping other economies. If we're only getting a two or three or low percentage point yields, what about using those as community investment bonds in the future of this community? Very quick response from a, from a committed education. So don't be fooled by the fact that your kids can hit Google because they may not know what to do with 3,500 hits that they have. James Fellows from The Atlantic published an article which was subsequently transformed into a book called Is Google Making Us Stupid? And he talks about the pancake intellect in which people like myself, obviously not Paul, obviously not Vice Chancellor, obviously not my colleagues, but certainly me, skate across the surface of a thousand different things and never pause and stop and drop down. So in fact, some of the search engines that we have access to have the potential to make all of us incredibly productive. But if all we do is read the opening line or the opening abstract and then the conclusion and then nip on to the next one, if we never stop and pause and drill down into things and consider and reflect and take time and think and think quietly, then you wind up in a Tower of Babel. So in fact, the value that can be garnered from harnessed by these substantial search engines can do us a very profound disservice. My own experience of 25 years of teaching at a university is that you must be very, very wary of the assumption that your children know better than you do how to navigate the digital wilds. It's not always necessarily the case. That's encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez, that's very good to hear. Um, we're going to round off because there were other questions, but I think it's, it's time to, to get together and collar each other and offend each other at great depth. Over a glass of wine or whatever you might want to do. Take home messages. Simply this change is very hard. As, as we heard before about Titanic, change is incredibly hard and people only do it when they have to. That's, that's the big challenge for all of us wherever we're confronted with these kinds of changes. The educational revolution, just referred to before, has hit universities and it's really hard to change them because people do not want to do that until they have to. So that's one of the challenges to take home. Are you prepared to change? What, what's been described here today is a reality. The people leave here today and say, well, that's interesting. <coughs> looks like we're going to get older. It looks like certain things are going to happen to our community. It's going to be better. Or do we say, that was a reality that we're going to have to do something about. And then the next question is to say, there really are opportunities here. It's not, it's not like we're looking at this reality and saying, well, there is nothing that can be done that's positive. In fact, there are communities all over the world by the same question, are doing things which are making them vibrant, desirable places to live. So there are concrete things you could start to do as a community that Palmer the North can do as a community. Actually, everybody south of Auckland has the same issue. We operate in Auckland and Palmer's North and Wellington. Auckland is a very different conversation because they're on the opposite side of this debate. They are growing whether they like it or not. But Wellington is not. It's having the same debate you are here. How do we go about this? Swapping ideas, sharing things around the country is going, I think, to come back to Richard's point, to get back to some regional development here, generated by the regions themselves. So take home that message. There's opportunities here, but do you want to take them? Will be the question that you have to confront as you, you leave the building. Can I thank you for coming? Can I ask you to thank our panel? Can I thank Paul Spoonley and Richard for their earlier input? and wish you all success in, I think, taking what is already a fantastic community, frankly. I think it's a wonderful place here in Tamanaki. Hoping that you can take it forward to the 21st century in a way which will make people like Hayley want to come back here. She won't stay here. She'll go, but she might want to come back, and that's what you're after. Thanks for coming.